Welcome to the third episode of Coffee with Cal in partnership with Custom Bite. I am Jordan Cornett with ESPN. We help coach Cal annually with his basketball fantasy experience. And as an extension of that fantasy experience, I am very excited to enjoy my coffee with Coach Cal this Monday morning, as we will be doing for the next 17 weeks. Coach Cal, beard's coming in. How are you feeling this morning? It's growing, but I just need to know, will it get darker or does it keep getting whiter? I don't know what's going on with this thing. I'm not that old to have gray hair. What's going on? You got that George Clooney, Ocean's yeah, Eleven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except the rest of my face, I got a nose that's pretty big. I turn it sideways and show you. I love it. All right. Well, through Coffee with Cal and all the donations raised, they're going directly to select charities that benefit kids in need during this COVID crisis. Blessings in a backpack, Feeding America, No Kids Hungry, and World Central Kitchen. However, don't forget, folks, the best way to help Coach Cal and the goal of providing relief to kids in need is just watching the series, sharing it as well. So make sure you tune in every Monday morning, 1030 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, without Coach Cal, none of this would be possible. And Coach, I know you have a special guest, a longtime friend of yours you want to introduce, who's doing some big things to help in relief. Well, he's he's always been charitable. He's like a brother, Todd Blue, uh, watched the show with President Clinton and called me and said, listen, you know I help you with the fantasy experience. You give away all that money, but I want to do something now. And so, Todd, tell him what your plan was. Thanks, Coach. First of all, you inspired me with the beard, so I grew one because of you. <laughs> but um, and then it was really kind of Jude on the on the call to, to uh, make reference to our friendship, which also inspired me. Um, so met a nice young man here in Texas. I've known he and his father a long time, and he came to me about a month ago and he said, "Hey, I want to uh, em emulate a couple of these programs around the country. This one's called Feed the Front Lines Texas." And basically, it supports local restaurants and um, obviously delivers meals to hospitals and all the people fighting the good fight on the front lines. Uh, those programs are going along everywhere. So to, to be able to give in your local communities and for your organization to, to do such a wonderful job to spread nationally inspired me. And so about a month ago, I challenged this kid. And I think we were, his name is Ben Schechter, and he have, and a few of his colleagues from Bain, uh, started this organization and basically I gave him his first very small donation. I think it was, we gave him 10,000 to start. Since that time, he's raised $400,000 wow. and has delivered 15,000 meals to hospital workers in Texas, Tennessee and other areas. So I'm very proud of this kid. And because of you guys and my inspiration, I wanna uh, do that again and, and donate on, in, in your honor, uh, $50,000. Well, Todd, you're the best. I mean, uh, we've known each other a long time. And the reason you got a good heart, a caring heart, he cares about his people. Um, and now you're doing this. This is why we're doing this. Uh, the, our guest today is, is a great friend, but again, somebody with a huge heart. Um, and so what we're trying to do is get like minds together. And for everybody, just... One, start in your own neighborhood, start in your own community, start in your own town, start with your neighbor. Biggest thing for us, watch. We've had over 2.5 million people watch the first two shows. I'm like, people must be bored that they're watching that many people watch this stuff. But I'll tell you what, I'm with what Jude is doing, over a million dollars uh, that we're going to be able to give away. And I'm looking forward to other people uh, stepping up and doing stuff. It's great. Well, you know, Big Blue Nation, as you have always said, goes a long way and has a beautiful spread. So it's our honor. And going way back to when William introduced us and Kenny Payne and and all those um, great memories of driving around Kentucky selling your books, even though I didn't read. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Hey, uh, how many books his father, Todd's father, is one soul of the earth, one of the great guys. I bet you not knowing he bought a thousand and still has them in the garage, knowing your dad. He probably does. And, and your good friend, my wife, Karen Blue, who's, who's also co-chairman of our foundation, uh, you know, she'll take as many books as you'll sell anytime, every time. So, okay, <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Todd. Coffee with Cal, another week, another incredible guest. That's just how Coach Cal does it. And I don't need to tell you much about our next guest here. He's an Alabama native. He was a legend at Auburn. He was a legend in the NBA, a Hall of Famer, did it all on the court. 
Off the court, he's the most entertaining man in front of the camera as a broadcaster on TNT. Coach Cal, go ahead and introduce this man. This thing is going to bounce. This We're having coffee with Charles, which means there's stuff going to be flying here. I got to, first of all, Charles, they built a statue for you at Auburn. A statue. With hey, well, first of all, two things. Uh, number one, I'm probably the only person in the world who's never had coffee in my life. <laughs> uh, second first. And let me tell you, secondly, as much money as I give in Auburn, they should have built three statues. Hey, Come on, gonna, man. You know, you know what I said. I saw that statue. I looked around. And I was going to take a pee on it, and there were people watching. So I said, I better not do that. Um, you know, Charles, here, here's the thing, and I want to hit this off. And, and Jordan and I were talking about it. You are, you've been huge, whether it was in college, whether it was with Philly, you went to Phoenix. Um, you were always involved in every charity I've ever been. You remember back in the, uh, the Jimmy V golf tournament days? Oh, yeah. like we were all and you were involved in everything. But in all that time, you've been one of the most approachable, uh, approachable rock stars. Like none of it bothers you. And you you talk to people. I mean, where where do you get that from your mom? I mean, where where why do you have that mentality? Well, I learned it from Dr. J. Uh, Dr. J, when I got to the Sixers in 84, he says, you know, sometimes the fans going to be a pain in the ass. Sometimes you, you can't sign all the autographs. You can't take all the pictures, but always be cordial. Uh, and part of your job is to sign autographs and take pictures. But, you know, obviously sometimes you can't do it all. But he said, you got to always be cordial. I mean, Dr. J is the only guy I've ever seen he can tell you no and you say thank you. You know, normally, <laughs> normally when you turn fans down and tell them, they're like, oh, what a jerk, blah, blah, blah. I don't know, whoa, you all call your name. Dr. J is so polite. And when I meet fans, man, if somebody take the time to come up to me, say hello, whatever, if I got time to set, sign an autograph or take a picture, I'm going to do it. Uh, but I'm going to always be cordial. Sometimes I'll tell them, hey, I can't do it. There's too many people. I won't get to enjoy myself if I have to sign autographs all night. But I just, I, I, I just want you to know I'm not trying to be a jerk. Uh, but I just try to be cordial, Cal, because listen, yeah, that's the interesting thing, you know, people talking about coming, or whether coming back to this season and things like that. I said, I, to me, I don't know if I would want to play basketball if there was no go, not going to be any fans. The fans are part of the thing that makes sports great. I mean, the best thing about being a, like being a player is you get to change somebody's day. No matter how bad your day is going, if your team is doing well, no matter how bad things are going in your life, you get a little reprieve, a couple of hours. You don't have to think about family problems. You don't have to think about your job. So to me, that's what's going to be very interesting when everybody talks about when we're going to play football, when we're going to play basketball, hockey, and baseball. It's going to be really weird if we have to play sports without the fans, but they're one of the best experiences. All right, so I got to bring this name up. One of the most positive people I've ever been around. And when you watched him coach, he coached you, Cotton Fitzsimmons. You know, it's so funny. I was just with his wife, his, his, his wife, Joanne, uh, Friday night. He is one of the greatest people I ever met. Never had a bad day. Even when he was passing away, he was like, yo, man, are you sure you're dying? This dude was the most positive guy who was getting ready to die I've ever met in my life. I would hope when they told me I was going to pass where I'd have that positive attitude. Uh, but, you know, I've got, I got to know him through Nike. And when he got, when him and Jerry traded for me in Phoenix, he says, listen, don't go by all the stuff you hear about Charles in the Philadelphia media. He'll be great in Phoenix. He's a good guy. And when I got traded to Phoenix, man, it was, it was a, it was a great time in my life. You know, what, what's funny, uh, I would golf on that Nike trip. You know, Phil Knight and Cotton were like a team. Yeah. And I was with Bobby Kremens and I. And uh, you never you never beat those two on purpose. You always let them win. You push a putt, <laughs> they're winning. Those two, I told – and and Bobby was that way when we played cards. Bobby would do – he'd let, 
crazy, right? Bobby Cremens. He well, lose well, so you could win. Like you yeah, can't but, be that nice a guy. Well, that, to, to me, what was interesting about that whole Nike trip was, first of all, everybody who's ever coached in college basketball has been on those trips. And they only invited me and Michael and Moses most of the time. And I had never met these guys in my lifetime. And then the next thing I know on these Nike trips, you know, they, they see, first of all, they take you to a, a wonderful place. And I'm playing cars with these guys every night. We're playing golf with these guys every day. So one day I remember telling people, I played with Bob Huggins, Gary Williams, and Gene Cady. And I'm thinking to myself, I'd only seen these guys from a distance. I said, this is going to be the longest damn day in my life. I ended up having the best time I've ever had probably playing golf because Katie was great, Huggins was great, and Gary Williams was great. But to see all you guys, and, you know, everybody had their families, and we just have cookouts every night. Yeah. And it's, yeah, and just to spend time with these living I, legends. I got one question. You play with Bob Huggins. Did he ever lose a ball? I've been with him when I saw a splash, and he'd go down and say, I found it. I'm like, Bobby, hey. I saw a splash. What do you mean you found it? Yeah, uh, Bobby's one of those guys who's going to hit the ball three fairways over, and you can hear a couple whacks at it, and then when it gets to the green, he's putting for birdie. I mean, <laughs> it was amazing. Oh, I, no. I got, I got another friend like that named Earl. He does his acting. He to, he's a big old muscle guy. He hit the ball three fairways over. And when he gets to the green, he's putting for birdie or a par. And you know he's hit the ball like three or four times. But I right, love so, those Nike trips. Oh, they, it was – when we went to Hawaii, they're hitting it in the lava rock. And you yeah. see it ping pong all over the place. <laughs> and Huggins would go down. There'd be 50 balls down there. He said, I found it. I said, Huggs, come on, man. All right, so I got to tell you the one story with my wife and I. We go to the trip, and I want to go play cards because we're all playing cards at night. And uh, she goes, you don't go play cards. I said, all right, I'll, I won't. And I'm laying in bed, and I'm about an hour, I look over at her with one eye, and she's looking back at me with one eye. So it was hard at times to get out and do everything because, you know, but we had, that was a ball. That was a ball. Let me ask you this question. Um, I told the story, and you probably have a ton more than me, but I traded for Jimmy Jackson. It was the biggest trade in the NBA up until that point. I think it was nine players, ten players, whatever. That The team wanted to trade me, and I didn't want to be included in the trade, but I, we moved a lot of people, okay? So when I had Jimmy, if you remember, he was a tough, competitive. I mean, this dude would fight. And I love coaching him. So one of the early games, we're playing in Chicago, and he gets hot. And he was, back then, there were some post-up guards. Like, he'd go in the post. Oh, yeah. So he went, he gets going on Michael, and my, the whole team is egging him on. He's talking. And, and so Michael walks over to the bench and whispers to Jack Haley. You remember Jack Haley oh, passed yeah. away about three years ago. Oh, yeah. He whispers to Jack, who had been with Chicago the year before. And when he walks away, I said, Jack, what did he say? He said, he told me to tell Jimmy to take off his shoes. He's wearing Jordans. Take them off. And after the game, he went up to Jimmy and Jimmy had 33 points on him. He remembers that he had 33. I didn't remember. Jimmy remembered. But he had 33, and he told him, listen, just know you're wearing my shoes. I'm not wearing your shoes. Dude was competitive now. You know how he was. Woo. Hey, listen, I, I tell I tell people that uh, I got a couple of Michael Jordan stories. So in 1984, I get invited to the Olympic trials, and that's probably – at least 30 Hall of Famers was in on there. We started with like 120 players. And my coach says, Charles, I want you to go to the Olympic trials. You've been invited. I said, coach, you know, Bobby Knight, I don't know about him, blah, 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 blah. He says, no, just go. He said, I think you're the best player in the country. I want you to go there and prove it. So I go there. So we go, we got 120. And like I said, it's probably 30 or 40 Hall of Famers. Everybody who ever played and NBA in the last 30 years was there. So they go 120, 
to 100, 80, 60, 40, 20. And then they finally cut me. And I was pissed at Bobby Knight because he never gave me a fair chance because I, I was the best, second best player there by far. Uh, uh, I, I was definitely the second best player there. The, the, I'll get to the story. So who, I get, I, you know who was in front of you? Oh, Draymond. Okay. No, no, Draymond no. Green. Yeah, okay, okay. So I'm going to tell you something. So I'm going to the airport. It's me, Carmelo, John Stockton, and Terry Porter. So I wow. get cut. I, I go back to college. And Sonny says, hey, I talked to John Thompson. I said, yeah, what did he say? He says, you were the second best player there. I say, I say, yeah, coach, I was the second best player there. And he says, who was the best player there? I said, coach, I just saw the best basketball player i ever seen in my life. His name is Michael Jordan. He's from North Carolina. I said, I've never seen a basketball player. Like, I, I thought I was a really good player. But this guy is the best player. I mean, I, I, he says, he plays for North Carolina. He's a, I said, coach, I don't know where he plays. I think he plays for North Carolina. And I said, this dude, we call him, he's, I said, he's really black. He's got really black. Uh, we call him black cat. Yeah, we call him black cat. But I said, this dude is the best I've ever seen. That's my first recollection of Michael. So then we, uh, I don't make the team, obviously. So we're playing together on the dream team. So we're playing in Portland, Oregon in the Tournament of the Americas. So me, Chuck Daly, David Robinson, and, and Micah go out and play the morning of a game. We're not playing at like 8 o'clock at night. So we go play. We play 18. And Chuck says, okay, that was a great time. Michael says, now I'm going to play another 18. We're like, Michael, we got a game tonight. He says, Chuck, I'll be fine, blah, blah, blah. So Michael comes back after playing another 18. We're getting ready for the game. Chuck says, hey, uh, Charles, you got this guy. Uh, Patrick, you or David or Patrick, whoever started that night. Scotty, you got this guy. And then Michael says, he says, uh, somebody, you got to get. Michael said, no, I got him. And it was the point guard from Puerto Rico. And Chuck said, well, he's the point guard, Michael. Michael looks at him. He says, I said I got him. I read something he said about me in the newspaper. And I got him. And the whole room's like, Dude, you just played 36 holes of golf and coach says, and you're going to go out to point guard. Michael would not let this little dude dribble. He's talking to him. You know that old stupid drill where you try to turn guys that you're like, no, you can't go. Go, turn the other way. Michael had played 36 holes of golf and he's talking to the guy the whole time, Cal. Hey, don't you ever talk about me publicly again. I'm Michael Jordan. Don't you ever talk about me. <laughs> and, and and then when we hey, and then when we get to the Olympics, he's like, we played Croatia, and that was Tony Kuko. And you remember Tony Kuko was making more money than Michael and Scotty at the time. And Chuck says, uh, "You got this guy." And Michael and Scotty said the same time, "No, no, no, we got him." <laughs> and, and Scott and, and Tony came in averaging about thirty-five to forty points a game. You know, the international team all their best player got. He don't have a green light. He got like a purple light. They held this guy to like single digits. I think he ended up going like six for 30, but they would not let this guy. When Michael makes up his mind to be competitive, like that's. that's, So so I got to ask you, the worst thing you could do is piss him off. Am I right? Yes. Like don't, don't engage him. Right. He take uh, it it, because it's going to be personal. Yeah, and he tried to engage you to make it personal. Like, yeah. So I'll give you Kerry Kittles, rookie, 17 points in the first quarter. I sit down, and Kenny Gaddison is my assistant. He's sitting beside me, and Michael's staring me down. And I look at Kenny, and I said, is he looking at me? And Kenny looks up. I think he is. So I kind of tilt my head up like, why is he looking at me? And he went like that. And I, and I turned away real quick, and I said, Kenny, what, what do you think that means? I don't think he's going to let Kittles get another basket. Charles, he yeah. didn't score another basket in three quarters. He didn't. You know, Cal, I, and I tell people this, the closest I've ever seen to Michael is probably Kobe. That's no disrespect to LeBron. I, I compare LeBron more to Magic. But, but I got to stop you. Didn't LeBron try to see everything Michael did 
and tried to mimic almost everything? He came, he's not a natural born killer. Listen, that's the big difference. Uh, LeBron is a nice guy. Like He's a he hell of a player now, too. He's, oh, oh, no, no. He's, he's big. He's, he's, he's he, hey, that's the biggest point guard you'll ever see. No, I'm saying he is a great, great person and a great, great player. The thing that separates Michael and Kobe, and you've seen all the teases for this documentary. Michael says, I want to win at all costs. He wants to win at all costs. I think Kobe is the exact same way. LeBron wants to win, but I don't think it's life or death to him. Michael was obsessed. Like I said, he took, like, he's obsessed with, like, I have to win, and I'm going to win. Let me let me give you, I'll give you one story and one, one thought. So we're playing them in the playoffs in New Jersey. We hadn't been in the playoffs in years. And unfortunately, we got the eight seed. So now you got to play Chicago. It best of five back then. We go to Chicago, we play well, um, have a chance to win. Uh, Michael steals the ball from, uh, I believe, Kendall Gill, last play of the game, and lays it in. We lose by two or four. So, um, but there's a timeout, Charles. He comes in, we're at 30 seconds. He comes in and sticks his head in our timeout. What do you think I said to him? You should have cursed him out. Gee, I didn't say one word. I looked the other way. Like, I'm not engaging this dude. So he kind of stuck his head in. And then when the team walk broke, he, he walked with me down the sideline now. And then when I walked back to the bench, I'm walking back and I'm looking at Kenny Gatt. I says, he following me? Like, if he had grabbed my arm, I would have said, excuse me. I'm sorry. I don't know what I did. But again, if you made him mad and engaged him, it was all you. Because he would not only do it, he would tell you. I'm doing it because he was competitive. Now, let me ask you. Here's my opinion. I'll give me an example. There are players that played in an era. You, the guys at Utah, I can name others that played in that area with, and it went from Detroit to Chicago to Boston, all in, and you're in with those four Hall of Famers on one team. And yeah. so I think – some of this should be by era, like how you're judging LeBron and Michael, or how about Michael and uh, Wilt? You know what I'm saying? Or how about Wilt and 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 Mikan? I mean, I think it's almost like there's an era, and this guy was the best in that era. But for Michael, people don't realize he also guarded. Like he was, he was the best first defender. Team. And maybe would you say during your time in the league he was the best defender? Easily, easily the best defender. But I think the difference is, like, listen, it, it, this is my list: Michael's one, uh, Oscar Robinson's two. Yep. Yeah, here's another one in his era. Yeah. Who was better? Yeah. Russell, Wilt, and, and, and Kareem. Uh, no particular order after Michael. Kobe six. LeBron seven. Then you got uh, Elgin Baylor, Jerry West, Anthony Magic. Davis. I'm throwing Anthony in there somewhere. Well, well, he's not in there yet. He's not in there yet. But he, you know, I love LeBron and everything about him. But I do think the way they play the game today, he didn't want any part of those bad boy Pistons. Let me tell you something. Those guys are out there trying to hurt people. Uh, those guys, are, I used to always tell people, when you were going to play the Pistons, you got to call home and tell your family you love them just in case you never saw them again. Like, they were out there really trying to hurt people. And that's one of the reasons I, I, that's one of the reasons I always tell people when they have this debate, I said, listen, no disrespect. I said, Kobe's the close-off team to Michael, and I got nothing but respect for LeBron, but they don't change the rules where you can't touch people now. Hey, did, were love, you playing when they did the hand check where you could put your hand? Mo, and the guy Cheeks, hit, Mo yeah. Cheeks told me that he could put his hand on the guy's waist. And I think it may have been Oscar that would guide players because Bro, he you, could long, and he would, you could grab their waist. When you could, when you could hand check, some guys were so strong in their hands, you could do anything you want to and you couldn't move. 
Like they were just like palming your body basically. And there was nothing you could do. I mean, some of these guys were out there, they were just so physically strong. And it was mainly the guards. Uh, you know, it's hard to control big bodies, but there were some guards who had such strong hands, you could not move if you were a guard. They had you on uh, total control. Coach, Charles, this is a good point to interrupt it and remind everybody out there listening, a special thank you to our friends at Custom Bite. They continue to make an impact for COVID relief with each purchase. $10. From every custom by product purchased throughout Coffee with Cal is donated to the Cal Foundation. Now, Charles, let me ask you. Hey, I got to stop you, Jordan. First of all, they got the one that you don't grind your teeth, and we're all anxious right now. And then they got the one that whitens your teeth for all of us to drink coffee. So yeah, they, they do a great job with that stuff. Sorry, Jordan. Yeah, so make sure you visit coffeewithcal.org and click on custom by for more information. As you guys are talking new school and old school, uh, Charles, I feel disrespectful even mentioning this, but Draymond Green has taken another shot at you saying you're jealous of his career. Sounds crazy to even say. How do you respond to something like that? Well, Jordan, you've known me for a long time. One thing, Chuck's not, I'm not jealous of anybody. I like messing with him. I like him. I think he's a good player. I like his personality. But I get annoyed when these guys who are born into money think they're successful. I told you. He's like the worst member of the boy band who doesn't realize he's standing next to Justin Timberlake when the when the girls are throwing panties at his head. He gonna hit get hit by some drive-by panties, but they're really throwing panties at Justin Timberlake. You know, uh, you know, you see now without I tell people, Draymond's a good little player, but without Kevin Durant, Clay, and Steph, he's just a good little player. You know, and he's a good role player, and I like him too. But I, it annoys me when these guys start talking about, well, they won something. Yeah, I mean, there's some guys who won stuff who play with Magic and Bird. But they don't go around talking about how great a player they are. they just like, man, I'm lucky to play with Bird and Magic and those guys. But uh, like I say, I like it. About what, what pick was he, though? He was like the 28th pick. It's a hell of a pick to take him. And I want to say this. All that being said, you have to admit – his spirit on the court and his competitiveness fit in with that group. You know what I'm saying? It was a hell oh, of a yeah, team. Yeah. He, oh, yeah, oh, Cal, I, I've never said anything better. He's, his, his energy, and he works hard. But I'm saying, though, I, I don't – he's a lucky dude to go to that guy and play with them three guys. How about you and I? How lucky are we to be where we're sitting? What? Hey, what? listen, what? You, 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 I, can, I can tell you this, Cal. You know, Jordan, you asked me about being jealous. Man, I'm a little fat kid from Leeds, Alabama. I grew up in the projects with a single mom who was a maid, uh, raising uh, four four boys, and my grandmother. Hey, ever since I got out of that situation, everything else has been pretty much gravy for me, man. man. I was blessed. I was blessed to go to Auburn. I had three great years there. Got a chance to watch Bo Jackson play which was the, probably the highlight of my college career. Played eight years in Philly, four years in Phoenix, four years in Houston. Uh, been stealing money on TV for the last 19 years. <laughs> hey, man, I'm the lucky. Hey, hey let, let's, let, I'm going to ask you one, but I got to tell you, like, I grew up in Moon Township. It was, my dad was a fueler for the airlines. It would be Friday to Friday. One of the things we're on here we know if that happened when you and I grew up, we would be looking in that line to get money and food and everything. It, 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 we, our parents and families would have been the first out. So oh, it's no. not, we know, which is why you got the heart, or at least I'm trying to do stuff to raise money and bring awareness and all that stuff, because we know, like you have never forgotten where you came from. And, you know, I, I know, Look, we were, my parents, my mother, my dad was a grinder. My mother's thing was dream beyond your surroundings. Dream beyond, this is where you were born. This isn't what you're going to become. Dream big. And she was the one that did that. My dad was a guy, he grinded and he's still alive today. Um, Got to get him to stay off the roof. And he's 86 years old and cutting grass and doing stuff. But this, this well, stuff now... Well, it's like, like you said, I got well, one thing. Here's what he said to me. He goes, 
and we're playing when I'm at UMass in New York City in the NIT or something, preseason NIT, whatever it was. He comes up to the suite of the Marriott in the corner kind of suite. He looks on the back of the door and sees the co- what it cost. And he knew the mortgage for the house we grew up in, and it wasn't that bad. We're talking the 70s, was $63. That was the mortgage. And he looked on the back of that door, and it was like 600 bucks for the night. And he's like, I don't know what you're doing, son. Keep fooling them, whatever you're doing. Well, it just sounds like to me you're just cheap. You should have somebody cutting his grass and doing his roof work for him. Come on, man. Look, he hey, he hit me one time. He was up on a ladder cutting the tree, the limb, and the limb hit him in the head, almost put him in the hospital. I said, what are you doing? Stop. I couldn't get him to stop working. He worked until he was like 75. You know what he was doing? Lugging bags. He worked for U.S. Air, throwing bags on the plane. At 75, the guy's incredible. I wish I had his energy. Wait, Cal, please don't lie about the energy. There's nobody got more energy than you. But you know what? You have made, I always tell people, man, the key to life, if you can make your parents proud, and that's all you can do. When I speak to kids, and I speak to kids a lot, whether it's high school or college team, I said the, the, the name on the back of your on your jersey, that's your family's name. That's a really big deal. Like, I, I, I know that I made my mother and grandmother very proud. Uh, I, I've exceeded all my expectations in life. I mean, I, I mean it's, it's amazing. Like I say, I'm from a small town of a couple thousand people. And to see where I came from, and I go there, I got one brother still alive and four nieces. And I and I, a lot of out, my business stuff is still in Alabama. When I go there, I'm still amazed that like 57 years later, I mean, I, I, I can't believe my life. I'm the luckiest dude in the world. How has the NBA, inside NBA, why is that so popular? What makes that like, People would rather watch that than the game sometimes. Well, you know, Cal, I think that people don't understand. Like, we're on from 8 to 2.30 in the morning. So, we show, obviously, we show two games, East Coast, West Coast. I think we have reached a perfect balance of, okay, if you want to talk serious basketball, we can do that. But me and you both who love basketball, we don't want to talk serious basketball from 8 to 2.30 in the morning. That's just stupid. So... I think that we have found a perfect balance. Like, okay, we got two basketball games. We got about six hours. Let's make sure people ho- – first of all, we hope the game is good. I mean, the only bad nights we have at work when we got crappy games. Because then, cause then you'd be like, we have to go in every medicine cabinet in the house to find something to do. But when we got two good games, it makes life good uh, fun. But we still have a couple of hours where we have to be silly and stupid they, they keep not just the basketball people, people who don't like basketball watching. But that's really the key. I mean, you're going to get basketball fans, but for something to be successful, you got to get people who don't watch basketball to watch. And I just think we found a perfect mix of, okay, let's be serious. Okay, now let's just be stupid. And, and you know what? You can tell, one, you're all really smart. But two, you Everybody all- was Shaq. Shaq's not smart. Stop it. Okay, well, the other guys are. But here's what I would say, that you also respect each other. Big time respect. And you can absolutely, it comes through the TV screen that you can joke with each other, but you can be that way when there's great respect and you care about the other guy. You both can do it. And so I I would imagine that's big, big with you guys. You know, I've been really fortunate. We got Ernie, who's the ringleader. Uh, me and Ken he's the been, best, by the way. The best. Yeah, he, yeah, and he's just a great person. And then you got Kenny, who me and Kenny's been there 21 years. I've been there 19 years, and I think Shaq's been there eight or nine years. And, man, we get along really well away. We have some great battles on the air sometimes because, you know, Shaq gets mad when we – like, Shaq's always been the best player, always. Like, me and Kenny, like, we have to actually, like, have a game plan against certain guys. We ain't always been the biggest, most talented guys. And when we try to talk strategy with him, he gets so mad. He's like, strategy, get the ball to me, let me dominate. 
And we're like, dude, that's just for you. Everybody else in the world, like when I'm playing against Carl Malone, Kevin McHale, uh, you know, some uh, somebody like that, I, I can't have the same game plan. And Ken is like, yeah, when I play against, uh, if I had to play against a Russell Westbrook, I, don't, I can't have the same strategy against him against a Steph Curry or somebody like that. But when we try to get him to talk about strategy, you could just see the blood vessels in his head just <laughs> popping all over the place. And I and love you, it when I get him riled up. And you mentioned names. Carl Malone was ridiculous. Um, how you had to, I mean, you had to double team him. And they had unbelievable spacing. But if you put him out of the mix, because you probably played him, what, six times a year? You had to play him and maybe playoffs. But what about yeah. Rodman? Did you ever play against Rodman? Oh, yeah. I played against him a lot. Did yeah, he? Because- you? He was a four man, even though he could guard five positions. Did he yeah. guard you, or did you guard him? He guarded me, and I guarded him. But but he was easy for me to guard because what I would do was just knock the hell out of him early, and then he would calm down because Dennis wanted to aggravate you. And Mike used to always joke to, with me about, "Yo, man, would you quit doing that?" So Dennis actually is a really good dude, but I would just knock the hell out of him early, and he would calm down. Cause I wasn't gonna go for all that. Cause he used to. I used to watch. He used to drive Carl Malone, Alonzo Morning. He used to drive those guys crazy with his stuff. I told him, I said, "Hey man, I'm not here for that." So I would just knock the hell out of him really early in the game, and he would calm down. He when we played them, the one thing that he hurt us with, he could switch out on anybody. So if you did anything where his man was screening. They could just switch out, and and he could guard it. Um, the one game we played in in New Jersey, I told this story. Um, the game ends. I I have to meet with the media. After the media, I'm walking to my office, and I go by a workout area, and someone's in there. It's him, and he's going hard. And I looked in, and I I said, Dennis, what what are you doing? He said, I got to stay in shape, Coach. We just got done playing a game. I walked to my office and I didn't want to leave until he did. He was probably in there an hour. Yeah. And, and he was like a freak with his body, like absolutely anal with making sure, because he knew that's what his castle was. That's what kept him where he was. Well, the two guys who I think are freaks of nature, Dennis is one, but man, Michael, Michael to me was the craziest ever. Like, this guy never slept. I, I, I mean, it was amazing how he could just, you know, I, I saw Roy Williams talking about, it, like, he turned it on and never turned it off. And, like, it was amazing. Like, we would take vacations together, a bunch of guys, and we played 36 holes a day. And then after two days, everybody was exhausted except Michael. We're like, yo, man, we need to take a day off. And, like, I've never seen somebody who can go without sleep. And when they show up, they just got that. Like I say, going back to that one time when he played the 36 holes and guarded the point guard nonstop, it, it was crazy to watch. You know, um, uh, I remember telling him I was uh, at a golf outing with him and I said, it'd be worth the NBA, each team playing you to come back and play a couple more years because of how he was. All right, let me, let, let's bounce off of that. Um, we're living in these uncertain times. This coronavirus, I keep saying, respect it, but let's not fear it. But you need to respect it. You talked, first of all, I've heard you on CNN, you've been there, one about you're responsible for you. But the second point was, and I'm asking you, let's talk about why are minorities dying at a higher rate than anyone else in our country. What what do you think that's about? Uh, economics. Uh, the, the black people, uh, brown people, and poor white people, they don't have good health care. Uh, I'm glad you threw in poor white because we're in Kentucky. I mean, well, there are you know, Appalachia. There are, yeah. you know. I, well, see, 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 John, I'm so glad you mentioned that because, there's, first of all, there's, probably, there's more poor white people than poor black people just because of the population. But poor, it's about poverty. 
And America is by far and away the greatest place in the world. You've been around the world and I've been around the world, but America is the greatest place. But the one thing that we have never done is take care of poor people. And one of the reasons it's really important is poor white people, poor black people and Hispanics, they do all the work at these hotels around the country. They do all the work at the supermarkets. Uh, you know, those, that's why we really need to make a conscious effort to attack the poverty issue with health care, because those are people like we can stay in our nice gated communities and our nice suburbs. But when we go and travel and stay at hotels, it's going to be black and brown people in there and the poor people working in these hotels and uh, working in these supermarkets and places like that. So that's why America has to address this poverty level when it comes to health care. You know, uh, uh, one of the things we were doing here in our own Fayette County, uh, the school lunch program for kids. Um, and the point was, let's help those kids. But this is different. Their families were the ones getting laid off. Yeah. So then what we tried to do is say, OK, let's take four or six hundred families and give them groceries each week for this period of time. We couldn't do everybody, but we, we were up to like 600 families still doing it now. But the idea was what you just said. They're the first ones to get laid off in all this. And yes. they're the ones that the least able to withstand it, like your mother and grandmother and my parents. They, if that would have happened when we grew up, Instead of the Friday to Friday, I was talking to these guys and, and, and I was talking to Jordan. I said, Jordan, you even know what spam is? You ever hear of spam? Like Thursday night was spam dinner because we didn't get paid till Friday. I mean, so you and I lived it and know it and you have some compassion for it. I don't know what the answer is. Is it let's build up this economy for more jobs and, and give it um, I, I, uh, the trickle down doesn't seem to go as far as it needs to. So what's the combination? Um, the health care, um, is it pre-health care? I don't have all the answers. Now, you thought about running for office. Has that still entered your mind? I mean, were you going to do it in Alabama? Where were you going to do it? Well, they, they approached me uh, several times about running for governor of Alabama. But then I realized that both of these parties are full of crap, the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, the, the Republicans do what they do. They take care of people who got money. Uh, uh, they got, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a Republican, you tend to be well off and you're looking for tax breaks and you're trying to protect what you got. And the Democrats, which I've been a Democrat my whole life, I just realized now that all, they have done an awful job of taking care of poor people. Uh, they make the same both every four years they come into the black community and tell we're going to make things better but they don't really make things better i'm still a democrat but i don't fall for the stupidity anymore i realize i got to take care of myself these you know even if you look at this this pandemic going on you know people are sitting around waiting on the government the government ain't gonna take care of you you got you have to say uh oh i realize now i better do a much better job of taking care of myself I mean, these people can't get tests, you know, and you just feel so bad because I'm start, I'm doing a hospitality program in Alabama and uh, we're raising money. So people, because these people who work in hospitality, hospitality they're going to get punched in the gut twice. Number one, they're not working now, but also even when this economy comes back, people are not going to have money to go out and eat. And that that's really when it, when all this stuff gonna hit the fan because, uh, and, and number one, number one, they're not gonna have money to go out and eat, but also they're not gonna want to go out and congregate. So this thing is here for a long period of time, and I don't have all the answers. I know you don't have all the answers, but you, all we can do is help the help the ones we can, and I think we're both trying to do that. Yeah, and I, and I tell everybody listening, you help this program by listening, but start with your neighbor. Go to your town, go to your city, go to your state, start there. Um, if you have more, then do more. Um, and and let, me, let me hit you with this. And this is the one thing that we kind of all forget. And, and, and I want you to think about when you were growing up, 
when you went to grade school when I did or, or middle school, it was also like, I got to go work. So you can't be here anyway, get to yeah. school. You know what I'm saying? And, and the stableness of the teachers and the school and the principals, we've got kids right now, not in school, grade school kids, middle school, high school kids, that it's where they get a stable environment. Yes. Um, we have the lunch programs. We should be worried more about getting these kids back in school. How do we do it? I don't know. Like you said, I would be guessing, but our focus should be how I even go to higher education. And I want to tell you, you have so, like if you're at a school like ours and there's Pell Grant and you have 50 percent of your students get Pell Grants, it's kind of like, OK, they get Pell because their families don't have money. to. Mm. So they're in this environment, half of our students. And it's the structure and culture and hope for them. We got to get people back in these schools somehow. I don't have the answer. I don't. Well, you know, but I know it needs to be done. And it should be done first. First. Well, you know, Cal, one of the things I've done, I just uh, gave my fourth million dollars to a historically black college. And I only talk to these kids about education. Uh uh, Morehouse and Clark in Atlanta. I gave each a million to in Alabama State uh, and Miles College in Alabama. I gave each one of them a million dollars. Because I only talk to these young black kids about education, which now is really important and significant. But I could, because we're not all in the same boat. And that's why I get a little frustrated when we start talking about college athletics. I says, guys, we spend all our time talking about. A small, the small little percentage of guys who want to go to the NBA. I says, I only concern myself with all the other guys, all the other young black men who go to college. Man, forget, you know, we talk about uh, likeness. We talking about paying these players. I says, guys, we only, that's like 1% of guys. I'm worried about the 99%. We got to make sure these young black kids get their education because that's going to dictate their future. Like, Can I say this? I got to cut you off and tell you in the last two years, the highest graduation rate of African-Americans in basketball has happened the last two years, not close. So we're doing my issue with the G league trying to entice players by giving them more money is not the kids that you're getting. It's the thousands of ninth and 10th graders that think, that's how they're going to make it when you and I know it's going to be 2%. So the other, and we're not talking 50, it'll be thousands and thousands and thousands. That's my issue. I think kids should go directly from high school to college if they can, if, or to the NBA, if they can, if not, you go to college. If you have a lifetime scholarship and I don't want to hear, well, we'll give out scholarships if a kid is a ninth and 10th grader, wasn't preparing himself for college, he can only go to a trade school. So if he doesn't make the G league, he's in a trade school. What we're trying to do is say, Hey, if they go direct, I'm good. But if they're going right now, kids can go to the G league. You didn't have to pay them more. They can well, go right now from high school to the G league. I just want to make sure we're on the right side of history and that we don't look back 10 years from now and say a whole generation of kids. And what's the demographic that we're talking about? If it were 50 kids, 60, how many of them would be African-American kids? Most of them. Okay. So what we're basically saying is the kids that need education the most, we're trying to get them to go directly to professional basketball through the G League, which you know they're not being paid that way. Well, and so well, let me say, so, so you know what, but we, I actually agree with you on half of that, and I disagree with you on the other half. First of all, I hate drafting high school players because they're not ready for the NBA. You know, people look at Kevin Garnett, Kobe Bryant, and LeBron. They don't look at all the rest of the guys who sucked who came to the NBA. They're not physically, emotionally, or mentally ready to play in the NBA. I think they should have to go to college for two years. I'm able to look at the big picture. I would love to see these guys go to college for two years. It's not going to hurt them. They're not ready for the NBA. It's all about the money, and I understand that. But 
I hate that. And first of all, I hate the G League thing because what the G League thing is, they're going to cherry pick the top players. They're going to be playing in small little cities. They're not going to be playing against great competition. Well, they should they'll be playing against professionals versus yeah, playing they, against yeah, another they, college hey, player. Hey, not good professionals. <laughs> if they were good professionals, they wouldn't be in the G League. <laughs> Come on, man. Hey, listen. <laughs> There's going to be one or two players, uh, and, I, and I hate to talk bad about the G League, there's going to be one or two players that may make it to the NBA. Now more are going to make it. They're going to cherry pick the best high school players. But most of the players in the G League are never going to step foot in, on, in the NBA. And here's, I don't like that. Here's where I am. They're talking about, well, we don't want them to go to – Australia, New Zealand, you're not talking that many kids. Well, we don't want to have to go travel. Well, you're going to travel to see these kids anyway. So I'm not going to argue with them, but here's my point. I want to see in the next four to five years, the kids that chose to go to college, how they did, because you're, the money you're going to get is negligible compared to what you will get if you really are good and get to your second contract. You have to get to your second contract. If you want to have that money that you have, Charles, you got to get to your second deal. And if you're young enough, you want to get to the third deal. But you know, that's but, where but, where but it all listen, is. Listen, you know, but listen, what are the chances that you're going to be LeBron, Kobe, or Kevin Garnett? And let's be realistic. Kobe Bryant struggled. He's one of the greatest ever. Kevin Garnett struggled. LeBron is the only player in my 34, almost 40 years in the NBA who was ready to come out of high school and go directly to the NBA. And you're talking about the top guys. The rest of these guys, they are not ready. Uh, and then let's let's take this young kid uh, who went to the G League last week. They, you know, they were making a big deal that he made a half a million dollars. First of all, Cal, me and you know that ain't a half a million dollars. It's taxes. What about taxes? <laughs> hey, I talked to my guy. I talked to my guy. He says, "Yeah, they keep saying a, uh, they keep saying five hundred thousand. I, I said, "Let me tell you something. By the time he pays taxes, pays his agent, and he gonna have two hundred thousand dollars." Maybe. Wait a minute. You got family. You got. You're trying to. You know. Because you're going to have to bring your family with you, so that you're money's going to go even quicker. You're, you're 17 years old. You're 18. You're bringing your family wherever yeah. you're going. To go to a major college, whether it's Kentucky, Auburn, Duke, North Carolina. No, no, Kentucky. don't say those other two. Just say well, to go to Kentucky. This, yes, isn't, this hey. isn't coffee with Bruce. That ain't hey, what this hey, is. Hey, hey, listen, there was a rumor going around that you canceled March Madness because you didn't want Auburn to beat you again in the tournament. Uh -oh. Well, hey, George. let me ask you, when they beat us in overtime, were you just so happy or would you did you think of me and say, I'm happy for Auburn, but I feel bad for Cal? Or did you say, I don't hey. give a shit about Cal. I'm glad they beat his overtime is even better. Hey, it's a can bigger I, can, stab can, in can, the heart. Can I, can I, can I ask, can And we I, beat them by 30. Two weeks prior, how did that happen? Oh my I, I, God! I, I, hey, how do I answer this question right here? Let me go see. Because people say to me all the time, because you know, you you see me on television, you see me on radio. I really like you a lot, and I brag about you. So, when people say to me, Chuck, why do you like Cal? What should my answer be? He's a good guy. No, but every time when I brag about you all the time, even going back before, listen, I'm going back five or six years when we're doing March Madness, and I brag about you every year. So people always want to know why I like you. What should I say? Um, geez, I don't know. This should be easy, coach. This should be I, easy. I, <laughs> shit. <laughs> well, I, what I'd like you to say is, you know. I, no, I don't know what you would say. Bro, maybe Other than, how about this? An I just known him for so long. I got to act like I like him. I mean, I don't know. You know, I tell people, I said, you know, I do like you a lot as a person. And I always talk about, because the one thing I've learned about March Madness, you can actually coach, man. Because let me I tell you something. That. A lot of these coaches can't coach. Oh. And, I and I never call them out. 
I never call them out because I don't think that's my job. My job is to support March Madness. But the one thing I noticed during March Madness, I said, man, some of these coaches, they have a game plan going in. They never make in-game adjustments. And it drives me crazy. Because, you know, you've coached in the NBA. In a seven-game series, you make 10 you adjustments. Change. How about this? You better change out of bounds plays. You better. Right. You better. Like, like sometimes I'm watching March Madness, and a team will run the exact same. Hey, hey, they run the same play five times in a row and get an easy shot every time. I'm like, the coach is gonna change that defense, isn't he? He's gonna hedge on the pick. He's gonna have the guy go under. He's gonna have the guy over. They're gonna double. I said, you got to have at least four game plans going in, depending on what's working. And I, sometimes I'm, in March Madness, I'm looking at these games, I'm like, this coach. Hey, yeah, let me tell you what's hard, though, Charles. One game. Think about the NBA if they played one game. They oh, should I, do that sometime. Oh, Play I one agree. Game. Let's, I go, agree. let's go a tournament. How about we start the NBA season with a tournament that's one game? Hey, first of all, I play. agree with you. Would that be uh, unbelievable? Uh, there you uh, go. I'm helping first, the NBA now. What's hey, going first, on? First of all, I'm going to just tell you the exact same thing. That I, we did a conference call last week. Kenny Smith said the, the exact thing you just said. And I just told him, I said, that's the worst idea I ever heard. <laughs> the, hey, the last thing we need is the New York Knicks against the Sacramento Kings in the final. Oh. Woo. So Kenny, Kenny, this was Kenny's idea. Guys, since we can't finish the season, we should have a Mars Madness format and it would just that we'll call it NBA Madness. I said that's the worst idea I've ever heard in all my years on television. But but you know, you guys don't want that team to advance that was an eighth seed. It's like every fan in college basketball wants the one seed to lose to the 16. When Virginia lost to the 16, you got to understand all of us coaches say, whew, it wasn't me because that was the first time a, a one lost to a 16. Let me say this. I had a, you know, Jim Gray, Jim Gray, you know, I think he's a, a media guy that's going into the Hall of Fame this year. Uh, good guy. He came up to me before 212, 211 or whatever, and he said, how do you, if that Mike, and he put it in my face. He said, how do you feel about being the best coach to never win a national title? Now, I, I, I'm, I'm going to okay. – and then after we won it, he came up to me and said, how does it feel to be the worst coach to ever win a national title? <laughs> I said, what? Jim, I mean, I can't be both. How am I both? He, he and I laugh about it. But, uh, you know, this stuff, what you've been able to do, Charles, with staying connected with Auburn, letting people see you for what you are, because you never hide it. This is who I am. This is what I stand for. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. Um, the USA basketball stuff where you stood up for our country and did what you did. Biggest thing, how many NBA players get to leave that and have enough in them to say, now I'm going to start another profession? And you're, you think about it. You're probably part of 2%, 3%, because some of them have enough money. They don't have to work again. But I think having enough money isn't what this is about. What drives you? What moves you? What is moving you now, Charles, to keep doing what you're doing, have the impact and the statement? What keeps you going? Like, you're going nuts right now because you're not working. What, what moves you? Man, if you don't help people along the way, there's people help me along the way. Uh, you know, I think about Moses Malone all the time, who was already one of the greatest ever. I remember when I went, I asked him one day, Moses, can I come to your penthouse tonight? We lived in the same building. And I said, Moses, why am I not getting a play? He says, you're fat and you're lazy. And I said, what do you mean? He says, you're fat and you're lazy. And he said to me, Charles, you weigh 300 pounds. You can play at 300 pounds at Auburn. You can't do that in the NBA. And one of the greatest players ever met me before practice. He said, let's get to 290. He met me after practice for like six weeks. He got me down to 280, 270, 260, 250. I should say, I got down to 240 one time, but I had no strength. 
He made the, the one of the greatest players ever took a young fat kid from Leeds, Alabama on this wing and said, Hey, you need to lose. You, I'm going to get you in shape. And he didn't have to do that. He was at the end of his career. He didn't have to do it. So Ken, you know, there's so many people in our life. I mean, I think about my mom, rest in peace, scrubbing people floors. I mean, like, I didn't know, like you say, your mom's a maid. And then you think about like, damn, your mom is scrubbing people, toilets and floors. And, and then when you get lucky to have the gift and my mom, my grandmother worked in a meat packing factory and we barely made ends meet. Like I like, I, and people, I, I, I want to help people. I mean, one of the reasons I'm giving all this money to charity is like, man, people just need a chance. You know, I mean, they, and they, and they want a hand up. They don't really want to hand out. They have dignity. They want jobs. They want to work. They want to hand up. Here, yeah. Here's what I would tell you too, Charles. For me, it's all about, and I didn't know this when I was young, the relationships that are created along the way that in a relationship is a two-way deal. It's not what they're doing for me. It's yeah. what we do for each other, how we make each other feel. Um, right now we have, college teammates all on a call because Jeff Zumagale turned 60 today. So there's 20 <laughs> people on a, on a call, you know, throwing stones at them and laughing and you, you don't get drunk. Don't buy Corona's. You don't want to drink Corona's tonight. I, don't yeah. have a good time. I mean, but you think about my high school buddies and, and yours, your college buddies that, and all of a sudden you start thinking of the relationships that were created and you hope like you're saying, that you added something to somebody else's life. For me now, what I'm doing in coaching, I went from the business of basketball to the business of helping families. And yeah. you know what? My life became easier, more joyful. I want to win every game. You watch me coach. I'm sweating, yeah. I'm yelling, I'm grabbing, I'm hugging them. I want to win, but not at the expense of the kids. And the greatest day is at the end when these kids make it and make their own way because many of them, came from generational poverty, generational, not that their yes. families didn't have anything. No, no way did they ever have. And now that has changed. And, and I think I've been blessed because I'm here, Clarion University, UNC Wilmington. I'm coaching at Kentucky. I look out the window. I didn't play for any of the great coaches. I was a good player, gym rat. I was small, but I was slow, but I wasn't, you know, but I'm coaching and get a chance to have an impact. You do it, and I'll tell you where else you do it. You do it on TV, because you don't know who's watching and listening and saying, I want to be like Charles Barkley. And they go to school, and they go for that. And all of a sudden, you're funny, you're smart, you care about people, you have an ego like we all do, but you'll be wrong sometimes where other people can be right. This, this, uh, you and I have been on a heck of a ride. I just want to ride this thing a little while longer. You know, I don't know how much it's going to be. Just let me stay on this surfboard. I'm, you know, it's a little bit tilty, but I'm, I'm hanging on for dear life. Hey man. Uh, and one of the reasons I, I'm doing this with you, you know, I got love for you and I'm listen, and, and I, I don't want to be stupid or crazy. You know, if everybody talks about uh, Lou Gehrig, the luckiest man. I think I'm the luckiest dude in the world. I mean, sometimes I'll be like, man, what an amazing run that I've been on. I mean, when you're growing up in the in the projects in Alabama, you're not thinking like, yeah, I don't be on the on the dream team playing the NBA for 16 years and be on TV for 19 years and I'm doing Cal's podcast. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's gonna that that's gonna actually happen in your life. I mean, nobody hey. nobody's hey. that cop. The greatest thing, and I know you did the same. All my guys, the first person they take care of is their mom. Yes. You stop working. You're going to live different. You got a house. You're going to get a new. The first person every one of these kids take care of is their mom. And, and what's better than that? I mean, you know, again, where we've been able to take care of our parents. And, and you know, this thing right now, what everybody's going through. You talked about it. You got, you're working out. Tell them what your routine is right now, because you got to take care of yourself both physically and mentally through all this. Well, you know, Cal, I like to drink. No. Oh yeah. Yeah. Really? When did that start? 
Well, when I realized there was other people going to be in the bar with me, uh, <laughs> never, hey, hey, you know, people always joke with me, say, man, you drink a lot and you gamble a lot. I says, yeah, clearly other people do it too. I never been in a bar by myself and I never been in a casino and nobody else was there. <laughs> uh, you know, but you know, Cal, this was okay. So I said to myself, Chuck, you know, you cannot do nothing or you'll go nuts during this period. So I said, okay. Uh, and I got a bunch of guys who live out here in Arizona with me, and we're like, okay, guys, we like to drink, but we can't drink every day. I mean, first of all, we know that we knew this thing was gonna last at least six to eight weeks. We can't drink every day for six to eight weeks. We'll go crazy. So we said, okay, we're only going to drink on Friday and Saturday. And I said, okay, that's perfect. I had to give up Diet Coke because I was drinking 10 to 15 Diet Cokes a day. I cannot have any Diet Coke. Haven't had a, a Diet Coke since this thing started. So, and then we said, okay, we're going to work out twice a day. So we get together every morning. Uh, I bought myself an outdoor bike. I got a Peloton over here. I got an elliptical and I got a treadmill. And I said, we're going to work out twice a day. We're going to practice golf every afternoon for an hour, hour and a half. And we're going to play three days a week. And we've done that every single day for the last six weeks. And even though we ain't accomplished, you know, because like none of us can work, we feel like we are accomplishing something. and and. And one of my one of my friends said he says we are accomplishing something and we're not doing nothing so we're winning so like yeah. I say we we get together every day and work out just to do something to keep our minds and bodies fresh and we go play golf three days a week and it's really been great because it gives us the time to be like man because a lot of people. There's a lot of people who won't admit it. They've been drinking every single day since this thing started. And there's people who ain't worked out. Well, like you don't have to have a gym in your house. You can go for a walk a couple of times a day. You can do sit-ups. You can do push-ups. Yeah. You can do stretching. You can stretch every day. You can do band work. You can all yes, that stuff. But there, but there are so many people who ain't did nothing. And at the end of this thing, they're going to be like, man, I really just wasted a couple of months of my life. And you did waste a couple of months of your life. If I'm I'm one of those guys, my mind races all the time. So I got to have structure in what I do. When I get up in the morning, what am I doing? Uh, and, and, and I'm trying to spend some time reading to grow a little bit, to give me some thoughts, to keep my mind going. But you go through working out. I got two dogs. I got to walk dogs. I carry the poop bag. I pick up poop. I walk the dogs a little bit. You come back. I'm even, how about this? I'm taking a little nap. I never take a nap. Well, I'm taking a little nap in the afternoon and then I come back strong. I got to say one thing about the Diet Coke. In 2012, I was sitting having dinner in Louisville, Kentucky, and I asked for a Diet Coke. And a kid named, a grown man named Todd Blue, said, You got to stop with the, the, the Diet Cokes. I have not had a Diet Coke since that meal in 2010. And you told, we talked to Todd earlier. He's the one that said, It's not good for you. Drink water. That's hey what man, I drink now. So when you said I'm done with Diet Coke, good, good, good. Hey, I asked, and I'm not even exaggerating. I had 10 to 20 every day for the last 30 years. I mean, I, I asked to like the way it tastes. I and, did too. I grew to yeah. like it. We yeah. all grew up on Coca Cola, and yeah. I like Coke. And then diet, we thought, okay, now we had a large pizza and five Diet Cokes and thought we were okay. I mean, what the hell are we thinking? <laughs> So I, I have I have drank. Listen, this is the truth. I've drank more water in the last six weeks yeah. than I have in the last 55, 56 years <laughs> of my life. I mean, oh it, my it's, guys. It, it's amazing. Hey, listen, well, I'm cutting this off because you and I could do this for another hour and a half and have fun with it. So let me just say this. This thing has raised a million dollars. Um Jude Thompson came up big. You heard what Todd, if there's anybody out there, I'm saying it again, do it for your neighbor first, do it for your town first, do it for your city, your state. But if you want to get involved, go to the website, coach Cal, what is it called? Coffee with Cal. What is it? You got it. Coffee with Cal.org coach. What is it again? Coffee with Cal.org. You go to it. You can join us if you want. 
listening and being a part of this. 2.5 million people have listened to this. I think today, Charles, people will listen to this and have fun with it. Even if we're making people smile on Monday mornings, I'm feeling good. Well, so, you we got to make them smile on Monday morning because I'm never going to have coffee, so I hope they, they smile at <laughs> Charles, I appreciate you, man. You're hey, a good hey, man. Hey, Cal, JD guy, hey, man, thank you guys for having me. Cal, you know I got love for you, man. Thanks thank for you, and me. I love you too, Charles. You're the best. Tell Kenny Payne brother. hello. I will. Thanks, I, brother. I got to say, for a man who said he's not a role model famously, he's become absolutely that to so many. Charles Barkley, thank you so much for joining Coffee with Cal. Thank you, JD. <laughs> we'll take care for now. And everybody out there to find more out about Custom Bite and how you can make an impact too, visit coffeewithcal.org. As always, uh, on behalf of Coach Cal, a special thanks to the nurses, to the doctors, and frontline workers. I know Charles backs this message as well for their efforts day in and day out. So join us next week, the fourth episode of Coffee with Cal, Monday, May 4th, 1030 a.m. Eastern Time. And Coach, they'll be following your social media the announcement of who that guest will be. We got on. a special guest. We're not going to let you know yet, but we got a good one. That's right. You have to tune in for that. Coach Cal, thank you as always for allowing Thanks. me to see at the table. Great Thanks, work. Jordan. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you, everybody. Charles, thank you. All right, man. Y'all be safe. You be safe, too.